All right, welcome back to All Eyes on Me podcast. I am Divinity, your host, and today we are interviewing Irene. A.K.A. your mother. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I feel like that's fair to put in there. (laughs) She's everyone's mother. It's not Lana, it's Irene. Hey. Um, So, we just met. I actually don't know anything about you. Awesome. That's why I'm so excited for today, because this is my way of getting to know you, too. Mm I mean, here we are. This is pretty <laughs> bare bones as far as my experience with podcasts. Like, yeah. like I was saying before the interview, I usually do music involved with my set. So it's just like some DJ segments. But this interview 101 is like, I'm out here. Yeah, you're out here, girl. <laughs> this is all about you. All eyes on you. I, know. I was like, oh, okay. And you didn't even know until you got here. No, but... I feel so like energetically I did that on purpose. I feel like you did too because I asked. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I like reached out to Irene. I was like, um, I want you to be on my podcast. She was like, what's it about? And I was like, okay, so here's the address. <laughs> yeah. What is it about? Okay, but I get it. It's cool. It, this is cute. I'm excited. Yeah. So um, I guess like we could just start this off by you telling us what you do for a living. Um, I was a hairdresser in Hollywood for about 25 years and um, DJed slow, solely in my bedroom, just off vinyl records over the years. Um, oh. I started doing hair many moons ago. Um, I think I officially started doing hair in 1997, and I was a lot younger back then, but um, I had a full career in Hollywood, um, and I was happy to leave and be done with it. I think it's a different kind of energy exchange that I could no longer facilitate personally, Mm. but um, but that led me into doing more community work and um, being more out and living my my truth. Wow. Okay, I want to talk about the hair career really quick, and then we'll get into the the current. Mm -hmm. So how did you become a hairdresser? Um, I really just liked doing my own hair and makeup growing up. I think it was a way that I learned to... um, kind of cope and deal with what was happening around me at the time when I was younger and growing up. So it allowed me... I feel that. (laughs) Yeah. um, It allowed me, like, privacy for one thing, you know. Like, I was able to actually... Like, I couldn't lock my bedroom door as a kid because it was just, like, rules. But um, I could lock the bathroom. So I just started spending way more time in the bathroom and just getting really, really over over the top with my looks as a kid and all through high school and... It was definitely where my focus was. Um, I grew up in the 90s when, like, the supermodels were, like, the thing, and we had these, like, larger-than-life, like, images of glamour, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I was inspired by all of that, so I I wanted to be over the top with everything. And I definitely spent more time and energy into my looks than I did, like, my classwork, I would say. Mm -hmm. So um, going into... Hairdressing was kind of a natural progression because I was already doing that. Yeah. By the time I was a senior in high school, I was doing everyone's hair and makeup for prom, but I wasn't going to prom. I was mm. even taking girls shopping like for their prom dresses, but I wasn't going to prom. I had no, wow. I had no interest. So you were kind of a rebel. Yeah, but I was also a raver. So oh, I was a <laughs> raver. Yeah. So I was like, I'm so much cooler than these kids, and was like, I'd rather you know chase a map point, you know, and find a party that was, like, where I was going to be, where I could feel a more sense of community because I felt like an oddball in high school and and growing up. And even in my early hairdressing careers, I was, like, the weirdo in the salon at all times. So I had a very, like, alter ego persona in nightlife that I developed over the years that was, again, another coping mechanism for the, like, mundane routine that I developed in the hairdressing industry I mean I did a lot of good work I was really good at it but I was became so uh energetically bored yeah and uninspired by it all give it ADHD it. do I yeah absolutely I do too. <laughs> why do I feel like you and I are so like yeah just snort it I'm like yeah of course yes no. um I just snorted last night when I was yeah, laughing I, I, Nas I mean, looked at me and it. they were like wait did you just snort I was like I don't want to talk about it <laughs> My friend Betty's like, well, let me check in. She just snorted. Hold on a second. Are you good? Um, but yeah, I feel like um, that led me to developing this like alter ego within nightlife yeah. that allowed me to be this side of myself that I would have to keep reserved in a lot of the spaces that I would be in in totally. the industry. You know, like 
you very quickly can be in a room with a lot of powerful people that are engaging in like their conversations where you need to become like this like mm -hmm. fly on a wall and like disappear in those moments and be invisible because like no one cares about your opinion in the room yeah it's true <laughs> you know and it's that true. isn't me that doesn't serve me I have a lot to say yeah you know well and I had to develop that as a hairdresser as well just learning how to take care of different people in the chair and there are moments where they want to vent and they mm. want to talk about their lives they want to talk about their opinions and you just have to stand there and cut their hair not say shit. <laughs> and then you go home at night and you're like, oh my God. <laughs> what was like the craziest thing that, the craziest client experience that you've ever had? Oh my God, are you kidding? Okay, can you even talk about it? Actually, you know what? Fuck it. I'll talk about it. Um, I broke a marriage up. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> I was not expecting that. <laughs> Bitch. Um, okay. but not in the way that you would think. So I had, this is in the very beginning of my career as a hairdresser. I was, um, it's funny. We're so old school. Cause we, I say hairdresser still and people are like, you're not a furniture. And I'm like, I know I get it, but I still say it, whatever. I, um, I think I was 21, 22. No, I was just out of beauty school. So I was 22 mm -hmm. and I was working at my first salon and I was taking care of a woman who eventually, she was so obsessed with her hair every time I did it that she eventually sent me her husband. Then I was taking care of her husband. And there was one day that he came in and he was like, you know, I have this new girl that's working for me and she's just feeling a little bit unconfident and I just want to make her feel good. And he came across as like this chivalrous, like I'm just trying to be a good guy and take care of my employee kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. And so he like prepaid for her hair appointment and he sent her to me. And so she comes in and she's a sweet girl, very young. She's like almost my age. And she's like, oh yeah, I just got this job. And can I tell you a secret? And I was like, yeah. And she was like, I'm dating my boss. And I was like, wait, wait. And then I'm like putting all the puzzle pieces together and I'm like, oh my God, he's literally sending me his fucking mistress knowing that I've been taking care of his wife for two years, like literally since the beginning of beauty school. And I'm just like... I don't even, and like, what do I do? I'm, I'm like 22. I'm like right out of beauty school trying mm -hmm. to like build clientele. I'm so anxious around creating drama, right? Because like, I'm like trying to build a name for myself. And so I'm like, okay, I'm just going to like act like this isn't a thing. And so I take care of her and I tell her that her appointment's paid for. And then later in the month, the wife comes back to me and she's crying the whole time in the chair. And she's like, I think my husband's cheating on me. Ugh. And I'm like, oh yeah. And I'm like, fine, stupid. And I'm like, oh my God, like what makes you think that? Oh, and just, oh, oh man, God, I'm cringing gosh. so hard right oh, now. I'm like, I'm already, oh, this story. And so I'm like doing her hair and I'm popping wine with this bitch. I'm popping weed. Like we're doing all of it. And yes, her hair still turned out good because she's a boss. But it was a whole fucking night. Like it turned into a seven hour fucking day where we ordered takeout and she literally was just venting to me the whole time. So by the end I slipped up and I was like, well, I mean, do you think that it could be his secretary? I don't know why the fuck I said that. I don't know why the fuck I said that. Cause, Cause it was the truth. Cause it was the truth. <laughs> and then she was like, you know what? Now that I think about it, you know, she is this perfect type and all this shit. And so, I don't know, eventually I just fucking sent her a message and I was like, babe, I'm not going to lie to you. Like, I, I definitely, I definitely have this intuition that he's cheating. And I just, I never like said I took care of his mistress because I feel like that would have been so hurtful, but like, oh, it was so bad. I was, I was disgusted. And I was young and I was just like trying to pay my rent. And I was like, damn, like this is technically not my business. Mm -hmm. That's the thing as a hairdresser, you take away things and you're like, this is not mine to carry. <laughs> and I'm not like, I don't, I'm not responsible for this. Like this mm -hmm. man and this fucking girl and then this wife, like, oh my God. But yeah. I mean, <laughs> what is there to talk about after that? <laughs> oh God. I'm just like, why? You know, Like definitely. you're going to get caught. That's just messy, but... I think now that I'm older and I've been doing this shit for 10 years, if someone fucking sent their mistress to me, I'd be like, there's the fucking door. Your money's not even worth it. I don't even give a fuck about your money. I'll be late on my rent. I mean, that is pretty messy. Yeah, That's it's pretty messy. messy. There's so many hairdressers. Yeah. There's 
that's just messy. No, it's messy. Like, what a dumbass. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> what's yours? Oh God. That's hard to be. Um, I had this. I I be I had a reputation for being able to handle the really like high maintenance, like really difficult like clients because like I just kind of don't give a fuck. You yeah. know what I mean? So um. <clears throat> And for some reason, they all liked me. I don't know. <laughs> Probably uh, because you're fucking mm-hmm. awesome and your mother. <laughs> so anyways, my my salon receptionist would like, you know, get these certain calls in and would just be like, you know, this is one for Irene. <laughs> you know, would pull yeah. me aside and give yeah. me the tea and give me the update and be like, okay, so this call came in. This call came in and it was this um, very wealthy to do man's assistant who was calling the salon to book an appointment for his daughter. His daughter was not allowed access to any money. Mm -hmm. So he was going to have his credit card on file to pay for her services. But before we ran her services, we had to call his assistant to get approval before we ran the card. Yeah. But under no circumstances was his daughter allowed to have access to that number. And we were, this was literally how the appointment was booked. Wow. Okay. (laughs) So I, I get her in my chair and I end up doing her hair um, over a period of months and, and the, the appointments became more and more difficult. Um, she clearly had a substance abuse problem. She clearly um, had been in and out of a lot of very fancy rehabs and her family just kind of like paid all of her bills and kind of like mm-hmm. kept her over there, which yeah. was really sad. So I had a sweet spot for her for a very long time and I took her appointments and she would continue to show up like hours late. And then come in and just be like disruptive in the salon and keep demanding to be seen because she didn't mm-hmm. care that she was four hours late and yeah. like that's not a that's not a small window of period of time to be late. That's like someone else. That's someone else's appointment time right. that you're literally just imposing yourself on. Totally. She did this multiple times, and the management of the salon kind of like forced me. Well, can you just give her a haircut instead of giving her a full service color and this that and the other? They weren't very supportive that mm-hmm. I was clearly being exploited. That's a whole other topic, but. Um, she came in one day, and I remember telling my management, this is the absolute last time that, you know, when, when she arrives late, because she's already, you know, at this yeah. point, she was already two hours late. She Two hours late? Yeah, and so she Bitch. ended up arriving, like, close to, like, three, three and a half, almost, like, it was, like, very ex- late. It was the end of the day, and um, I was already on my last client. Like, yeah. you know, when you're on your last client, you're like, yeah, you're I'm done. I'm so ready I'm to ready go I'm ready for home. Netflix. 100%. <laughs> and, um... The salon space had like you know air, like where you know each stylist would have their tools and stuff up next to their station and um, you know my manager was like trying to delicately like put her you know, let her down and be like Irene's not going to do your hair Irene cannot do your hair today. Yeah. She burst into like a full on like adult baby tantrum in the salon and I just came out and I said okay you know let's go outside and let's talk and I had to do the breakup thing you know where every hairdresser has mm-hmm. had to break up with clients before it's not easy it's sometimes yeah. harder than any intimate relationship you could ever try to break up with yeah. but um, every hairdresser has had to break up with the client so I was having a breakup moment <clears throat> and um, I told her that I wouldn't be able to facilitate her services today and that I don't think I'm the right hairdresser for you. Like, Mm -hmm. you need someone that can accommodate all your needs, and I don't think it's me anymore. And um, she threw herself on the cement floor and started to cry. And then she said, if you don't cut my hair, if you don't do my hair, I'll I'll shave my head. And I just just walked back into the salon at that point because I was like, I didn't sign up for this when I woke up this morning. You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) I didn't, I didn't, like, when I decided to go to work today, like, this was, this is way out of my my job description. 100%. So I was like, just, well, this is also someone that came from extreme privilege who was, was not told no very often. Yeah. And by this point in her life, like, she was being completely supported by her family to just kind of stay away. And it was really sad. Yeah. So, um, I went back into the salon and just went into the back room to hide where hairdressers go to hide. Mm. And she walked up to someone else's station and she grabbed uh, a pair of like Oster clippers, you know, like those really big Mm -hmm. ones, you know, Mm -hmm. the the metal blades and stuff. And she's like, if I really doesn't do my hair, I've got to shave my head in the middle of the salon. Like just the the full salon of clients and hairdressers. And everyone is like... Oh my God, remind me to never be late for my appointment. You know, like it Damn. was just kind of a like, ripple effect of like, oh, what is happening? Oh, yeah. I- Irene's got a live one again, you know, one of those. <laughs> and um, one of the, I was like, I, I'm. I'm literally terrified at this moment because I do not want to do her hair to save my life. I yeah. want to run so far and so fast. 
And my salon manager comes up and is like, well, do you think you could just, and I'm like, absolutely not. You need to have my back right now. <laughs> like, this is, I'm not being paid enough to put up with this. This is, this is so beyond, like, my job description. And um, at this time, you know, she's threatening and wielding the clippers around and, and um, trying to figure out how to turn them on. And um, the, <laughs> one of my hairdresser friends walks over and he just pulled the cord out from the bottom of it. Oh, my God. Just, iconic. Like, stepped back and was like, <laughs> now you can't shave your head. So, oh and it just diffused. You're lucky it's not wireless, bitch. It literally just diffused the whole situation where it was like, okay, now you're going to have to leave. You know what I'm saying? Oh like, my girl, God. like, you cannot, you're not going to get to shave your head. You're not going to force everything to do your hair after being like three and a half hours late for your appointment. This is insane. And it was like the beginning of my end of working at that place because I just had felt like I had been given so many like ridiculously uh, difficult clients. Yeah, it was almost the like, universe. I was like, I don't need to be here anymore. And totally. this, like, I, I took a step back. I went to booth renting and then just started to manage my own schedule myself, manage my own money myself. Um, yeah. Back then, I was working at a commission based salon, which we now know is kind of illegal. Uh, so, like, commission based salons are illegal. Yeah, you're not supposed to be doing that anymore. Okay, we need to talk after this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, salon <laughs> owners are not supposed to be doing that anymore. It's like very frown upon. Yeah, we need to talk after this yeah. because I'm like... <laughs> like, laws changed and shit got weird. Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, I haven't been tapped in on any of that because I've been a booth renter freelancer for so long. But, um, yeah, I know a lot of... I have of, so many friends in the industry that are still commission. A lot of my my former coworkers, like, came back and sued the salon owner for, like, paying things. Like, certain things were supposed to be, um, like... If you're getting paid a certain way and they're filing on you a certain way or something like that. Oh, my God. Like yeah. Hours, like, we, like, the employees, if you're being, like, paid like that, you should be given breaks. And, like, no one was given breaks, like, even the hourly. Wow. So it was just kind of, I don't know, it was just, like, I was thing. really glad because I was already really removed from the industry when those kind of things came in. And then wow. I just started seeing more and more people pop up with, like, uh, rental spaces, sweet no, spaces. No, this is news to me because I've yeah. always been a booth renter and I just now decided to go commission Mm because I thought commission was a thing but I mean if it's worth it yeah I mean and if it's clear and concise and like they're really only taking the percentage they say they're taking yeah I mean I gotta I gotta be honest my boss is great but I have a lot of friends in the industry that are constantly telling me about their commission situation and I don't know yeah because like for me in my situation like I don't care I'll tell T um in my situation it was like like I said, I did hair so many moons ago. It was like a 60-40 split. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, you could only get 40 if you hit this certain amount. And then if you mm. go over this amount, then you could get 50 or 45, 50, 55, 60 being the most. Right. So but then, but then it's like in on paper, that looks great. Because you're like, oh, wow, I make more. I get to take more. That makes sense. Yeah. But then it's like there's these all these hidden fees that start coming in. Mm. Like your color charges, like your charges for your cleaning lady, like your towel service charge. And you're like, well, what the fuck is my percentage going to? Right. If I'm paying these charges additionally on it, if I'm paying additional charges per client, like mm-hmm. a, a, per head, yeah. Like, that adds up over a pay period. Yeah. And if I'm doing, like, 45, 50 people in a period and I'm getting charged $2 a head for a sitting fee. <laughs> they seriously that's an additional... love to screw hairdressers over, I swear to God. Well, hairdressers aren't always on top of their shit either. Because yeah. it's... I know I wasn't when I was younger. I was just like, oh, I'll just make more money. Like, <laughs> Well, I want to swing back to... You said something that really hit... Um, that was kind of a sign that I needed to start moving away from Mm -hmm. the industry. And it it just made something click for me because I look back on that story that I just told you Mm -hmm. and I genuinely feel like situations like that, being a hairstylist in such a young stage of my life, Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, you know what happened here? I had this man manipulate me into taking care of his employee, Mm -hmm. AKA his mistress But I had that intuitive feeling that something was wrong when I said yes. Mm -hmm. And then when I've got the wife in my chair, I've got this intuitive feeling that she should know it's somebody that's at his job. Like there's just all of these things that I'm like, damn, my intuition is spiked for women. And now I should just forever take this with me in my, in, in, in my, uh, my career as, you know, my, my intuition is geared towards women and that's 
what me as a hairstylist is. Mm -hmm. It's me tapping into women. There it is. And then for you, it's like, okay, this is a sign. Like, I just, I don't know. I feel like there are things that happen to us in the hair career that are just like, okay, this is your path, bitch. (laughs) I mean, yeah, it's like, you know, it's like once you get into it, I feel like it's really easy to be like, oh, I would, I mean, I remember thinking like, oh, I want to work in production and I want to work on, you know, films and I want to work on videos and I want to work on all these great things. And it's like, I did all of that, but at the same time, there was a lot of disenchantment with it once you really get involved with behind the scenes stuff and you're really just seeing kind of like the smoke and mirrors of it all. And it's like, for me, it wasn't sustainable energetically or spiritually for for me personally, because after a while, I was just like, this just feels like... I'm, I, like I'm contributing to something that I don't stand for kind of a thing in, in that regard, yeah. you know? Um, what moved you out of it? Like what was the final, what happened in your life that made you stop doing hair? Um, my sister passed away last year, last uh, April, like on, around Easter. And uh, I'm so sorry. I took a long hiatus from that for obvious reasons. Like I wasn't able to quickly go back into the workplace Mm. and when I started to it was very 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 clear to me that I was like my heart is no longer in this my Mm. heart is absolutely like this like I dreaded going to the salon um and I still do and I I will happily take on certain freelance jobs if if I want to I, I love the fact that I have so much freedom in choosing my jobs now instead of having somebody dictate my schedule that has like absolute no sensitivity for me as a human being just a, like a mm-hmm. producer you yeah. know so it's like the jobs that I have now like I'm appreciated by my clients like yeah. the, I'm appreciated by the people that I work with still in a in a way that uh, makes me like inspired you know because yeah. I can't you know like I've pitched so many ideas I've done so many projects that, like never see the light of day mm. that don't have anything to do with with me now and who I am you know like I've competed mm-hmm. I've done all the things like I've I've done so much I've educated I was a platform artist for years like I um don't done it. I've done it yeah you know what I mean yeah. so I just kind of was like I, I mean I felt like I was hitting a ceiling a bit and, and that and, and I don't want to go corporate I'm like yeah. such a radical mm-hmm. queer feminist underneath it all that like going the corporate route is like soul-sucking yeah. for me didn't you also say earlier that um, you got sick in your twenties? Yeah, I mean also that changed. That changed things a lot for me, and um, because I felt like so when I was twenty eight years old, I got d- diagnosed with choroidal melanoma, which is a rare form of cancer in your retina. Wow! So it's very isolated to your you know your retina. There's all kinds of other different cancers that you can get in different parts of your eye. You know your cornea. You know things like that, orbital tumors. Mine was in the back of my retina, which caused a detachment that affected my vision on my left eye. So I'm very legally blind in my left eye because I had to have a radiation treatment in my left eye that would radiate the tumor, but it would pretty much kill my eyeball. So any, um, any vision that I have on my left eye is very minimal peripheral vision. I have no center vision out of my left eye. So I knew that once I went back to work, like, one, I had to relearn how to cut hair and Mm -hmm. use a sense of touch more so than my, you know, not just trust my eyes anymore. Like, I have to really, like, feel my way through the haircut. And, um, you know, it... I knew that I was just going to have a certain amount of shelf life before things could get more difficult or things could, you know, I don't... I don't want to be doing hair with an eye patch, girl. Like, yeah. I know it'll look fierce, yeah. but I just don't, you know. Um, I was really nervous when I got diagnosed that I was just going to have, cause I, I, that I was just going to have a lot of clients abandon sh- ship, you know. Like, getting your hair cut by a one-eyed hairdresser is like... Sounds badass. It, I mean, well, yeah, it could go <laughs> two ways. Lie. It could go two ways, you yeah. know what I mean? It could be the best haircut and you're fully impressed by yeah. it, or it could be like... Yeah, you're like the next TED Talk or you're the next... <laughs> um, Lawsuit. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So I wanted to tap out too before I got to that point. You know, I wanted to tap out before I got to a point where like I couldn't do something that I wanted to do because I'm really a competitive person. Yeah. I I like to be great at things. 
So I wanted um, to go out on a high. <laughs> so you were a rave kid, you did hair, and then you were like, okay, you know what? Maybe I'll immerse myself in the nightlife more. That was kind of your path. I think that when you have like an illness like cancer that like makes you really, really check in with yourself. Mm-hmm. Like I was 28. The, the average patient of cardiomelanoma melanoma is usually 65 and up. Wow. Already has cataracts, already has glaucoma, and then they may develop this type of retinal cancer at that point. So for me to be a 28 year old person who had it in a you know, primary form, meaning it didn't, it wasn't coming from another organ in my body, like it was just prime here. Wow. It like all my doctors were scratching their head, like it, all my doctors were like, "Well, this doesn't make sense." I'm like, "Well, that wow. doesn't make me feel any better. What are you gonna do about it?" <laughs> like, <laughs> I got a whole life ahead of me. I'm not gonna die because of this. Somebody needs to get to work. Who's doing it? Who's yeah. <laughs> I was very, like, adamant that um, – I just was very adamant that I wasn't going to die from that. I was just like, this is just, like, a thing that I have to get through because I'm not ready to die. So yeah. um, I, like, really, really, really had, like, hard rules on people that I was allowing next to me at that time during my treatment because mm, I was like – It's so you, important. If you're going to come over and cry, like, keep that shit at home. Right. Just keep it at home. I don't. I the only one that's allowed to cry during my radiation treatment is fucking me. <laughs> so like, mm-hmm. if you're a little too emotional to see me this sick, then then just wait till I get better and, and we'll we'll link back up. But mm-hmm. um, one of those people was my mom. I like she was so, you know, like she was just so ready to cry at the drop of a dime that I was like, mom, you cannot. Yeah. I cannot be consoling you while I'm having radiation treatment. Wow. That's not how this works. God, that's so real. <laughs> that's so real. Holy shit. And you know what? She agreed to it. She did. She agreed where I was just like, if you got to cry as you're walking up to my door and then cry again on your way home, cool. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying that in the time that you're sharing immediate space with me, like, yeah. I need to be healing. So, um, and she was cool with that, you know. Oh. And she was there for my surgery days because it was like, I had to have one surgery for them to implant the radiation implant. And then I had to have it go home and radiate for like six or seven days and then go back and then have them remove the implant. So it was like a two surgery process. Oh my God. And That's the, so wild that you had to go home and radiate. What? I know because uh, because of where... I didn't even know that. What? Because of where the tumor is, they couldn't do like a laser like radiation, which I was like hyped for the laser. I, I, oh my God. And then they were like, no, we can't do that because it's too close to your brain. <laughs> so if we miss it by a calculation, we don't want to like hit your brain with the right. laser. <laughs> I, <guess. laughs> I said, thank you. <laughs> that might not be well, then. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, then your haircuts would be lopsided. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> you know, so they did it with a, a this weird little like gold button that they like sutured. Wow. To my eyeball that had radiation seeds in it. So it's like, I mean, do you want me to tell you what they really did? It's kind yeah. of gross. No, so, down. Okay, so it's like I was um, I was what they call twilight anesthesia. So, like, I wasn't fully out. Like, I could hear everybody in the operation room, like, Holy operating shit. on me. I could hear my surgeon, like, checking in with the other doctors and stuff like that. And they take a little scalpel and they, like, cut your eyeball membrane open like a skin of a grape. And they just kind of, like, peel it back and they put the implant back there and they suture it. Wow. Sew it to your eyeball and then like put the membrane back together and then like sew it up. And then they're like, go home, Frankenstein. Come back. (laughs) (laughs) Come back when the timer goes off and then we'll take out the implant. When the timer (laughs) goes off, bitch, get out. (laughs) You know what I love about you? The the dark humor. Oh, I mean, I just feel like if you're a trauma survivor in any capacity at some point, you (laughs) You're going to have to laugh about it. I'm the same way. I'm just like, I've spent so many years crying. Like, I'm really cool with laughing about shit now. Kind yeah. Of, it's kind of comforting in that regard. I'm the same way. And then like... Being... I make jokes about my suicide attempts. Yeah. And people are like, oh my God, that's so dark. And I'm like, obviously you've never tried to commit suicide. <laughs> yeah, obviously you don't have suicide ideations. <laughs> oh my God. Or I'll be in the grocery store and I'll be like, wow, I'm so happy I'm not anorexic this week. And I'll have a woman turn around and be like, I'm sorry, that was... That's... Talk, I thought I was the only one listening. Sorry, I thought that was in my head. <laughs> it's using my inside voice yeah. on the outside. But I mean, that definitely led me to get more involved in community. And when I got, um, when I went into remission, I started getting more involved with different organizations that were cancer related. Wow. Um, and I did that for a while and got really immersed in it and really wanted to kind of like start my own nonprofit. And then I was like, wait a minute, like, 
I'm living in this constant state of never getting cancer again. And what am I really doing to my body and my spirit by obsessing on never getting this again? Mm. Like, am I inviting it back Mm. by thinking and reading labels and getting so obsessive on every single detail that I'm eating, every single ingredient, where it comes from and what I'm putting in my body because I'm now so terrified that I don't want to get cancer again. Wow. But, like, am I, am I living at this point or am I living in fear of getting sick again? Yeah. And that, for me, was a big tipping point to take a step back and allow myself to enjoy what made me happy and ask myself what that really truly is. What and, is it? What's happiness um, for you right now? Happiness for me, um, honestly, happiness for me is like feeling loved, feeling valued, and feeling appreciated. Mm-hmm. And I get that a lot through my community and the spaces that I've been able to curate and the connections I've made through the community here in L.A. Like, and, and other cities. Like, I, you know, I, I have so many... Um, I have such a, a like a big network of like friends and f- chosen family and supportive people that I've completely found by like coming out. Like when I had cancer when I was twenty eight, I wasn't out. I was very much living a straight. You weren't life. out. I was very much living a straight life. What? Yeah. I thought you were out at like fifteen. Everyone says that. Shut the fuck up. You're more gay than me. I didn't come out till I was thirty. What? Yeah. I had a whole ass husband, girl. I had a wedding in Malibu. I we rented a mansion. We like it was the whole thing. I'm so <laughs> confused. Oh my god! I have so many questions. Yeah, um, he Holy and shit. he and I were together for a long time. We were friends first, and it was just kind of like I felt like at that time in my life because I was conflicted about my sexuality and just kind of felt like. I was needing to go through the same the, the steps that my parents wanted to see me go through. You know what I mean? I was yeah. like next in line. Like I'm the third. It was my sister, my brother, then me, and then my younger brother John. And I was like, you know, my sister and my brother had already had kids, and both of them had been married and divorced. And you know, I was next in line. Yeah. So um, I felt like I was doing the right thing, but I was definitely miserable. Like we, I was. How old I, were you I was, married? Um, he and I were together um, probably for around like three or four years before we got married, married. And, um, In Malibu? Yeah, it was so stupid. It was so stupid. <laughs> Did you wear white? Yeah, I wore white. <laughs> I wore um, black and white. The whole wedding was black and white. It was gorgeous. It was wow. like goth and like red roses everywhere. It was in the, stupid. It rained that day, girl. It was like goth, goth, goth. Like Holy it was shit. really funny. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, we were, I, w- I wouldn't say we were a happy couple, but we were definitely a couple. And we were comfortable together. Yeah. Um, but uh you know, when someone gets cancer, you, again, makes you, like, put things into perspective where, you're like, okay, maybe maybe this cancer thing is why we need to get our shit together as a couple and, like, get married and think about kids, you know? Like, mm. maybe maybe this is happening to put things into perspective for the two of us and, like, what ask ourselves what we're really doing as a, as a couple. Wow. And so um, I remember um, he was working for a really big corporation at the time. Um, he's a really, like, successful graphic designer. And... Uh, he had a very good benefits package, you know. Yeah, <laughs> so we'll get that money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was like, "You need health care," and I think you're we should. Like, you're right. I do need health care. I do need health care. <laughs> um, and that was a that was a that was a selling point for me on finally walking down wow. the aisle. So, uh, yeah. And then the wedding kind of became like my project that I became fixated on while I was going through my cancer treatment and stuff like that. So I was like going to doctor's appointments, but, like, planning my wedding, and that was another way for me to disassociate, like, what I was going through. I started dreaming up this, like, fantasy wedding, no expense, like, even, like, like, nobody told me no. Like, I I was like, and I want this, and I want that. It was like, nobody fucking told me no. Because everybody's like, the bitch almost died. (laughs) Let her have the ice sculpture. (laughs) Give her the Vera Wang. (laughs) She wants a black diamond? Fuck it. Fuck it. <laughs> She's good. It's 40K. That's okay. You know what? No big deal. Um, wow. Uh, yeah. And uh, it was a shit show of a wedding. Like, I got really drunk. Wow. <laughs> I got really drunk. 
Um, yeah, it was a shit show of a wedding, but, um, so when, how did you find, like, did you know when you got with him that you were, I mean, I think that he and I both agreed that we were bisexual and or had tendencies and that was safe for me and him to kind of both like, can I tell you an observation? What? Because you and I have dealt with so many different types of people. Mm -hmm. I have never, and you can literally quote me on this i've never met somebody that has gotten married and is a hidden gay who didn't also marry somebody else that was also a hidden gay it's like two gay people get married every time it's you know never what just one i swear to god i don't need to put him on blast but he knows who he is and knows his past he knows his stories <laughs> you know what i mean we had similar stories oh so funny but, um and you know what um if he called me today, I'd pick up the phone. We always had a very um, m amicable, mutual, like, like divorce. When yeah. we, I mean, we actually stayed divorced for years because it wasn't a big deal for us to get divorced. He was living his own life and I was living mine. But wow. um, if I called him today, I know he would pick up the phone because he'd be like, she must be calling me for something important. <laughs> yeah. And that's just the respect that we always had for each other. So I felt like if, if he called me today, it'd be the same thing. I'd be like, he must have some, like, important... Something important. It must be something important. He doesn't just call me to shoot yeah. the shit, you know. How's but, your love life now? Are you dating? Oh, God. <clears throat> Should we talk about this? I don't know. <laughs> We're going to talk about danger this. zone. <laughs> um, I would like to say I have crushes, and I, I'm i enjoying my crushes right now I for for what they are. Mm -hmm. Like, I am an emotionally unavailable person at this juncture of my life, Um I was in a pretty toxic relationship for mm. off and on for about six years and two I'm of those sorry. years, two of those years were in the pandemic and it was just like oh, a lot of challenges on top of like having a break, like having a breakup in 2020, like I just kept referring to it as the extended breakup remix. That's what I would call it. I was like, such a DJ. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> we're still playing this extended breakup remix. Like track 42, uh, track 42. We're still here, you know? Um, huh. but like when, the whole world is shut down and you can't like go out and like be a hoe or something like that. You know, it just changes things. And I think a lot of people fell back in or stayed in toxic relationships that they probably would have walked away from if they had been able to, Yeah. you know, yeah. but, um, as far as now, um, I'm happily traveling, working, um, working a lot. And just, I think the things that I've been able to say yes to right now are things that, I wouldn't really have been able to do if I was in a relationship right now. Yeah. Like, I, I really like my freedom. Yeah. I've been really enjoying that. And I hate it, but every time I'm in a relationship, I miss living alone and having my freedom. <laughs> Why do you think that is? Um, I think I have major fear of commitment issues. Oh. <laughs> You've thought about this. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Where I've also had dear friends from? call me out, like dear friends. No, know. where does that come from, though? Is that because you're a raver? No, I think that it's just um, ravers are fl like free flowing. No, I don't. I'm not like in that free in that spirits, in that context. Hippie, not no. in that you have a genuine fear of commitment. I just have seen things like fall apart so many times in my life and in other people's lives. Yeah, like it just it's. I of course I would love to believe in like a person forever, my forever person. Like I think I I um have really, really, like, like really believe that for a long portion of my life and only started to kind of have a different perspective as of late. But, like, it's just, at this point, I'm not excited about starting anything new. Yeah. Because I'm just like, what is this that I'm going to have to get over later? Mm, that's so sad. <laughs> But that's so honest. You know, and I'm just kind yeah, of like, I don't I, I don't have it in me anymore. You know, like uh, the idea of meeting someone new and getting super like... I hate how hard that hits. Getting all the butterflies and things like that. I'm just like, okay, you're giving me butterflies now, but how long until you give me a panic attack? Yeah. <laughs> or how long until I don't trust you? Or how long until you all break my heart? All those things. So that's just me and my track record and my experience. But, you know, yeah. I don't think I'm an unlovable person or a difficult person to love. You think you've attracted people that you need to heal? I think I'm a sucker for a fixer-upper. And I think yeah. hairdressers... You give me that. that energy. Because we really do. We're like, you know, like, just a little bit here, a little finesse there, and I see the potential, and, you know, maybe a new cut, mm -hmm. new color. Yeah. <laughs> and then 
you're like so tell me about your love life can i fix it too yeah other like, than your bangs yeah, then it's like you just get so sidetracked on like um yeah. or i get so sidetracked on my own goals yeah because i'm like let me help you with yours because you clearly need more help but um that's why i feel like this time around in my love life i'm just doing really good by myself and i like that you know that's such an interesting perspective that i've never even thought about because People have always asked me, like, why is your love life so crazy? Wow, you're always in a relationship. And, like, I have been in two very serious relationships. One Mm. was – actually, it's crazy because they were both around the same amount of time. Um, I was in a serious relationship in my early 20s with my first girlfriend. Mm. We were together for one year with a label, but we were fuck buddies before that for the year – the year after that, we were together, we were broken up. We were together, we were broken up. The extended breakup remix. Yeah. Yeah. Track 42 <laughs> was my early 20s. And I was like, this bitch got me fucked up. This is why they say don't date a woman. Because mm. she's got me fucked up. And it took me so long to get over her. And that was my first. And then I dated people for years, you know, off and on did like a couple months here, a couple months there with different people, whatever. And then I found my second really serious girlfriend and it was during the pandemic. Mm. So it's funny because I, I hadn't given my heart away like that since my early 20s and getting into that a second time. But this time it's so much deeper. It's so much more clear. It's so much more mature because I'm older. She's older. We both know what we want. Now we're in the pandemic where we get to spend all this time together and we're in love and it's just like so much. And then, um, you know, I even moved across the country to be with her and like we were starting a whole life together. And so that heartbreak, I felt like I got put into a fucking car wash with my windows down. Yeah. <laughs> like, I was just, and, and this, this whole time I'm like, oh, I can just roll the windows up and it'll be fine. And then I'll just clean the inside of my car. <laughs> That's how I felt. I And my car kept filling up with water. And it just, I don't know. I, I was genuinely jaded after that. I was like, wow, I don't know if I can go through that again. See, it gets that messy. It gets almost messy. destroyed me, man. It gets messy. So me being in a relationship now with somebody that, I genuinely am like, wow, I feel like you're genuinely too good for me. But that's how I know that like I'm with someone that I deserve because I know that I deserve them. But it's like that kind of love where it's like, you're too good. Not just for me. You're too good in general. You're just too good for this world. Like you're just so pure and you're so kind and you get fucked over enough and you experience enough heartbreak that you, um, you really appreciate the healthy Mm-hmm. healthy is no longer boring you appreciate it and you want it and you don't want somebody that's mean yeah or somebody that's manipulative or psychologically abusive that like convinces you that you're not enough or yeah. you're too much and it's like it's both of those back to back and it's it's confusing as fuck it puts you through fucking mental hell you oh, know yeah. and now i'm with somebody that it's just peace and it's just like wow i'm I'm with someone that it's like, I don't even think about if I'm too much or not. That's how like peaceful it is. Yeah. So maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm sharing that with you because that person is who introduced us. <laughs> yeah, how we met. You know them. Uh, yeah. You know what I'm, ta- what I'm talking about. But um, it does yeah. exist. Just- I know it's out there. Um, I just don't know if I've missed my moment or if like, I was getting, <clears throat> I got this reading from one of my friends who's pretty psychic and she does a lot of my readings and healings and stuff and, um. She was doing like a, um, like a reading on me, and everything kept coming up like how, like, there is no true love for like a personality type like mine. Yeah. That um, my true love is through community, and like that reading kept coming I up in the reading, and it was just like. She was like, you know, I mean, it's just some people aren't meant to be in this, like, monogamous, like, one-on-one relationship Mm. for the rest of their lives as a definition of love. Like, some people, you know, live through community and live through, like, love through, like, their experiences with, like, lots of people and stuff. And so 
I've just been like really meditating on that and resonating that with a while. But I remember looking at her in the session and I was like, so are you trying to tell me that I belong to the streets? Because I'm hearing that. What I hear is that I belong to the fucking streets. I belong to the streets. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so I am biggie, is what you're saying. <laughs> so you're telling me to just like go out and be a hoe. Is that what you're telling me? That's what I'm hearing you know? You're like, you're the best psychic I've it's ever like had. Money well spent. <laughs> The psychic said I need to be a hoe. I'm just, you know, just doing God's will. Yes. At this point, no. You're just fulfilling your purpose, Irene. No, but I think that's a huge <laughs> misconception about me as a DJ is that, like, I'm going home with, like, randos at every single one of my gigs. Totally. Like, um, Aren't you a cancer? Absolutely not. I'm an but Aries sun with a Virgo rising and a Virgo moon. How I dare I say I cancer? Have an, I have an Aries <laughs> Venus and an Aries Mercury. Bitch, and, you're like all Aries. And I have a Cancer Mars. The Cancer is in my Mars. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, I was I, picking up Cancer because you come off as somebody that's not a fighter. Like you don't want to be a fighter. You will if you have to be, but you're you. You're yeah, love. I mean, I don't want to fight if yeah. I don't have to. But like, if you push me, like I will literally rip you to shreds. Yeah, I you know, pick that up too. <laughs> like, I will make you question your entire life. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I, I act. I mean, like. I, I get a lot of assumptions, I think, with the whole your mother thing, too. A lot of people think that it's, like, kink-related or fetishy, you know? Like, mm-hmm. I get really weird DMs. Um, I also am involved now um, as a DJ. I run a, a queer play party <clears throat> called Club Mercy with my friend Betty Bondage, and that's one of the one of the nights that we do. It's, like, a seasonal play party that we have in a dungeon downtown. We just had it this last weekend. It was our one-year mm-hmm. anniversary a really, really, really great um, event. So I do feel like that because of that particular event and because I DJ in a lot of, um, I started DJing in a lot of play parties when I when I first started to actually like DJ in public, which is weird because I was too scared to be in a club to have to make people dance. But for some yeah. reason, I was like comfortable like DJing while people were having sex around me. And for some reason, I didn't feel as self-conscious. Yeah. <laughs> I was living downtown, and I linked up with my really good best friend, Nacho Nava, who was doing, Mm. uh, he's the late and great Nacho Nava, um, rest in peace. He was doing a night uh, called Mustache Mondays, and he was also my neighbor at the time, so we just started to pass each other around walking our dogs every day, and I was like, oh, I'm going to come to your club, and um, I started going and just really, really felt like a sense of like, God, I, I can... I really loved the music. I was able to dance like all night. And that was something I had not experienced in a long time since being like a raver, wow. you know, because like I was just like, I'm not I'm not having any like moments of like salvation on the dance floor where I'm like really like really having a release. Yeah. And that was what got me into the whole rave scene like as a kid anyway, was because I did feel like, you know, it was um a community that I could tap into that I could have released and feel seen and mm-hmm. feel like I wasn't the only weirdo in the room. Like I wasn't the only one with like crazy hair or weird clothes or yeah. outlandish makeup anymore. So, you know, but then what I, but then yeah, at 19 I started doing hair. So I started going into my like hairdressing career and didn't have time to go. I didn't have the energy to go out on the weekends. You know, I was exhausted all the time. And then When I started feeling like I was pulling away from the hair industry, that was when I started tapping back into nightlife again and then really, really started developing your mother as like a thing Mm -hmm. and um, started getting hiring, hired more and more to host and to hold space and to, you know, for me, it was just a... Is that your, so is that your DJ name? Your mother? Yeah. It's a funny... I fucking love that. It's funny because I I, I spell it m-u-t-h-e-r so it's like a mother thing you know yes. and my sister and I used to say that to each other all the time because you know I'd be like she would always be like well I talked to your mother today do you know what she had to say about you and I'd be like oh really what did your mother say you know we just <laughs> were always like kind of putting our mom off on each other yes. like in a really jovial way and just being silly with one another again like kind of making light of situations yeah. you know so um that kind of just like weirdly stuck in a way where I didn't, I don't know, I just didn't think anybody was going to take me seriously as a DJ where I'd get stuck with the name, but I kind of feel like I grew into it more and more and it became this like personal joke between me and my sister, but then yeah. it became more of a, uh, more of a persona and more of just like a actual representation of just how I navigate through nightlife, you know, like yeah. I'm pretty, 
I'm pretty, I'm, I would like to think I'm a kind person, you know, I'm really kind and I try to offer as many resources as I can to people that ask for help. Like I teach people on the regular to DJ, like out of my home, like no big deal. Like if anyone says like, I really want to learn to DJ, I'd be like, make the time for it. It's not that hard. Like I'll let you practice, it's not, you know, for homies, like it's not that big of a deal, but um, it's just... I've always been very grateful for the elders that I've had within the gay community that have been kind to me when I was figuring myself out. So mm -hmm. I, that tends to resonate with me, you know. Yeah, it it yeah. tends to resonate with me through patience, but it also resonates to me when I do have to sit someone down and give them like a for real talking to. Yeah. I'm just like, I'm so know? grateful that somebody like you exists in the queer community, especially out here in LA. I because... feel like there's a lot of mothers out here too. There's a lot of a lot of us, I think, everywhere within different spaces and communities. Like... Well, there needs to be because I, I mean, I don't know. This is a episode for another day, but the gay community out here, especially the lesbian community, so toxic. <laughs> so toxic. I like really hate to say it, but I just but not feel... the whole, not the whole, yeah. just the scene. Just I the feel scene. very. Just the scene. I feel, I'm always identified as like a queer femme. Like I don't necessarily identify as a lesbian. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm welcome and invited into those spaces. And if anything, my heart of hearts feels like a fucking dyke. Yeah. And that, is a beautiful word to me that I deeply I, resonates with me. So it's like, I I work with Dyke Day LA <clears throat> every year for Pride. Um, I get to. DJ their fundraisers and then DJ their main event, which is like one of my favorite things in LA for Pride. Because mm -hmm. I get to usually bring my dog, you know what I mean? So it's like yeah. everybody brings their dog to that gig and it's kind of cute that. to have my, my kid with me. But um, yeah, I, I do another event called Les Qua that is like a seasonal event that I do with my partner, Romy. It started out with like four or five of us in the beginning in 2017. And over the years, it's kind of dwindled down to just me and Romy. Mm -hmm. And we do a New Year's Day, kind of a kickoff, like Breakfast of Champions, kind of daytime event I on New Year's Day. And then we do another one right around spring equinox to just kind of kick off the spring. <clears throat> and, that, and then we do another one for... Pride, obviously, we do two on Pride weekend. We do a Friday night and a set, or Friday night and a Sunday party for wow. LA Pride weekend, and then we do a Halloween. So it's not like a monthly thing. It's I would definitely say it's more of a seasonal party brand for us. What do you think of the scene since you're DJing it? I mean, I think um, I again, mean, gay I, gay scene and gay community. For those of you who are listening and don't know the difference, there is a massive difference. I think there's room for everyone. I mean, I think there's so the many... The scene is like the nightlife, I guess I, I think there's so many new DJs and organizers that kind of like got born in the pandemic that kind of just popped up out of nowhere that are... Cool. You know, there's new scenes and new talent out there. You know, there was like, of course, there was tons of warehouse parties that were happening like all through COVID. Like people were still going to yeah. spreader parties and like just raving their life away in the middle of COVID. Um, I was not. But, um, yeah, I think that those spaces kind of curated, like, new communities and scenes that kind of met and bonded together in the pandemic that are now doing, like, that. a lot of warehouse parties, a lot of different um, boiler rooms, you know, um, a lot of different things like that that have been coming through. But, um, yeah, I just, you know, couldn't really do the streaming thing, like, I tried, I, it did, it just felt so different as a DJ to like not be DJing with people in the room, like to, mm -hmm. but people are watching you. Yeah. <laughs> you can't see anybody, but like there's like, everybody's watching you kind of thing. It was just like, I had no idea of like, I'd always have to ask a friend to like moderate and just kind of like read the chat and like tell me if like mm -hmm. people thought I sucked or if like they actually liked what I was doing. Cause like, I wouldn't be able to know. Do you feel like you're natural at DJing? Yeah, I feel like I've, I've been immersed in the culture so much. I've heard so many DJs. I've been blessed to see so many, like, world-famous DJs from different eras. And I definitely know it sounds good. Definitely know it doesn't. <laughs> Even if it's me, you know what I yeah. mean? Like, I'm like, oh, that one didn't sound great. But, you yeah. know. Um, yeah, I definitely think that there's there's a lot of room for everyone. There's yeah so much um <clears throat> spaces now you know um you know why i think it's toxic what the, the lesbian scene yeah it's because because of the l word <laughs> <laughs> you said it not me 
there there's so many avenues I could go with that. <laughs> I mean, okay, look, the L word, <clears throat> the L word is definitely very real in a lot of ways because I watch that and I'm like, you know what? I could literally name a lesbian in my life that's just like that Absolutely. one and that one and that one. Absolutely. <laughs> like I have a Shane, I have an Alice, totally. Mm-hmm. Um, I okay. I'm not normally one to just throw the word toxic around, but I have found that in my experience as a queer in LA, I don't think we have enough people that give an actual fuck about people in this scene. Mm. I think people don't check in on each other enough. I don't think that people genuinely care about people on a human level Mm -hmm. enough. Um, It's very statusy, and and I know that that has to do with LA too. I know a lot of people come out here wanting to get their dreams, and they think going through the lesbian scene is the way to go because it's a smaller community, and Mm -hmm. you're more likely to be, um, you know, big fish in a small pond if you're in the lesbian world. Mm -hmm. So I've noticed that like there's so many people that they'll judge you based off of your figuring out chapter Mm -hmm. so hard that they'll just they'll just, you know, make up conclusions about you or, um, you know, they'll see you doing drugs or doing stupid shit and Mm -hmm. they won't think, is that person really okay? Because it's just the party scene. Mm -hmm. And I I think that you could say this about any party scene really, but I think that the reason it makes me sad and the reason I'm like, damn, that's so toxic Mm -hmm. is because during the day it is a community. We are a community. And you know, at the end of the day too, we're queer, we're all queer and we're all trying to figure it out. And your twenties especially is for you to be able to figure that out. And you're going to go in to these, you know, chapters of your life where you're going to be a complete fucking wreck. Mm -hmm. And to have somebody like you be like, are you really okay? That's so important. And I've had an Irene in my life that did that for me at my lowest point when I was doing stupid shit and Mm -hmm. nobody was checking in on me. So that's why I'm thankful for somebody like you, for like the young queers in LA that are trying to figure it out and are not around the right people. I think people like you are really necessary out here. Thank you. Um, I appreciated what you said earlier about, you know, your intuition and just tapping into what that voice is, you know? And yeah. I try and I've spent the last like, <clears throat> I'd say the last like three years just really, 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 really on a healing journey of my own. And through that, I've found so much like such a new relationship with my spirituality that um hearing that intuition and hearing that voice and tapping in on that vibration is something that I really really have spent a lot of time like honing in on so that I can like if like if someone pops up in your head it's not for any reason you know like maybe you you know now where I would be like oh that's funny I just was thinking about her the other day where like now if I feel like i have a a flash or a thought of a person that I haven't thought about in a a while, then I'll reach out to them instead of just kind of letting it be like a fleeting moment, you know? And, um, more times than not, like the response often is, it's like, you're such a witch. How did you know? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I just wanted to ask if you were okay because I hadn't talked to you in a couple of weeks. I say I'm a witch and it makes people so scared. Yeah, and I'm just like people no. are like, oh, don't mess with divinity. She's a witch, and I'm like, what the fuck do you think I'm gonna do? Ouija board? What do you think I'm gonna do? <laughs> I mean, I love a good hex personally witch. myself. I'm great at them. I can't. I'm totally good at them. Not uh, gonna lie. You know what? If there's enough, never mind. Okay. <laughs> Another topic. I work with a great organization that I met a few years back called EndOverdose.org. And they offer great resources to, like, training um, anyone, basically, on how to, like, spot a fentanyl overdose, how to treat it, how to administer um, Narcan, and educating people on, like, what the variables are there, you know, statistics, um, how much it takes, which is not a lot. Wow. Um, People only have a very small window of time before they'll actually overdose on it. So you knowing how to like determine that someone's having a fentanyl exposure and being able to treat them and having Narcan available at the event and testing strips like that just lets people know that there's harm reduction here and that we're trying we're not trying to tell you yeah. how to party <laughs> because people are going to do what they're going to do anyway you know yeah. um but to just be safe about it and to test your stuff and to always carry yeah something on it because you know even if people that I'm not with in my group or someone, you know, somebody else at the event could 
fall down like in the middle of a party like because they're having an exposure to fentanyl and it's in so many different drugs that um I think just kind of educating yourself and educating the teams that you work with and the venues that you work with and the staff that you work with and just making it very abundantly clear that like we have these things here at your disposal no questions asked I'm so happy that you came. I'm happy. Thank you for having me. This has been really cute. I'm excited to see what all you do. Thank you so much for watching, you guys. If you want more episodes like this, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button down below. My Instagram handle is Divinity Ray. You can catch me on all social platforms, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. And where can we find you, Irene? Um, I'm happy on Instagram, to be honest. And um, I don't like it to invite anybody to my Twitter. Cute. <laughs> So follow your mother, Irene. Yeah, at your, no, it's just at your mother. And M-U, it's Y-O-U-R-M-U-T-H-E-R. Perfect. All right, guys. We'll see you next time.